Well, I'm going to just remind you there's a card back there to pick up on your way out. Um, and on his uh, uh, table there. Uh, Brother Tim, why don't you come and introduce this while I get it set up? I'll just, I'll just stand right okay, here. Okay, that's fine. Uh, that, I'm, I'm um, going to go come around this way. So. Okay. Uh, yes, it's just a, it's about a five minute video and it just gives you an idea of what's going on there in Manaus, Brazil, uh, in the uh, northern Brazil, which is the Amazon River Valley. Uh, and that's where we've been working. Uh, actually, as a family, we've been working there for 64 years. Uh, Dad first went in 1956. Uh, I grew up on the field, he came back to the U.S., went to Bible college, found a wife, and went back. <laughs> and uh, Betty and I have been there for 40 years now. Uh, and um, just uh, praise the Lord for the health He's given us and, and everything. And, uh, but just to give you an idea, and so go ahead, preacher. South America. We have been sent from the Massillon Baptist Temple to preach the gospel, baptize those who repent and believe, and to teach all things that Jesus commanded us. Our ministry has been mainly in Manaus, located a thousand miles up the Amazon River, a city of 600,000 when we arrived in 1980, which has grown to a city of more than two million people. Manaus is the center of the Amazon basin, where people come for health care, to buy food, and all other things they need. Brazilians are no different spiritually than any other people on planet Earth. The God of this world has blinded their minds to spiritual things. So many have been enslaved by alcohol, drugs, superstition, false gospels, and materialism. They are a religious people, but they don't know Jesus Christ as their personal Savior. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Repentance and faith must be preached so that the Holy Spirit can draw them to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. The Bible says in Romans 10, 14, that faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Jesus said in Mark 1, 15, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent ye and believe the gospel. Those who are saved and baptized need to become a member of a to be able to fulfill God's purpose for their life. They need to be taught God's word and trained to be witnesses of Christ so that the church can continue fulfilling the Great Commission. The church is the light of the world and the salt of the earth. The Lord has called many Brazilian men into the ministry to continue his work. God has blessed us with about 35 churches in Manaus and over 20 churches in the other parts of the Amazon basin. The church is where we serve having fellowship one with another, and help one another in our Christian walk, a place to grow spiritually and gain strength through the study of the scriptures, a place that sends out missionaries far and wide, a place where we can worship our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. For Jesus said, I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. The Bible Baptist Institute of Amazonas began in 1973 with two couples. Joe and Elaine Hawkins, and Cecil and Sandra Henderson. In the past 47 years, many others have also helped teach and train men and women for the ministry. It has been fundamental to the work of the churches in Manaus and in other parts of Brazil in providing pastors and missionaries for the churches. Today it continues as a joint effort between our graduates who have been ordained into the gospel ministry and ourselves. We have turned over the institute to the Council of Pastors, who elect a director to run the institute. We remain as counselors, encouraging and helping where we are needed, but the administration of the institute is done by our pastors. 
more than 250 men and women have graduated and most are active in the ministry to this day. Three Indian Bible Institutes have been established on the upper Rio Negro River to train indigenous men and women to preach the gospel to their own people. The need is great as there are more than 500 villages in this area. Many men have been trained already and are laboring in this area and have also been invited to preach to the indigenous peoples in Colombia and Venezuela. God has also opened the door to preach the gospel on the Valpez River, a few miles upriver from St. Gabriel of the Rapids, uh, which has been closed to the gospel until now. God has called four men to lead this ministry, Pastor Luis Pedro, Pastor Alberto, Pastor Marcidio, and Pastor Boni. Pray for these men as they preach, teach, and establish churches among these peoples. Thank you for sharing Christ with the people of Brazil. Thank you for partnering with us. Uh, but uh, it's good to be here tonight and appreciate that song, you know, and even for the times that we're in, uh, that is a great song because it talks about standing on the promises. When doubts and fears assail, and we've had a few fears lately, haven't we? For about a year now, we've been in the middle of this uh, pandemic. And, uh, you know, I, I don't know exactly what to make of it. I, I don't know if it, if it was done on purpose or it was an accident or whatever. But the fact is that, you know, it has affected everybody in the world. Uh, not just here. Right now, our city of Manaus is in lockdown. Uh, there's a curfew from 7 at night until 6 in the morning. So... Needless to say, we're not having Sunday night services or Wednesday night services. Uh, we are having Sunday morning services uh, because we're allowed to go out. Uh, and they're telling you not to go anywhere. They just opened up uh, this, uh, let's see, no, tomorrow. Tomorrow they will open back up uh, the um, uh, shopping malls and restaurants and whatnot at 50% uh, and see how it goes. All our boat traffic is shut down except for um, uh, freight. And, uh, you know, here in the States, that's not a big deal. But where we live in Manaus, a thousand miles up the Amazon, that's about the only way you can get to Manaus, is either by river or by air. And so it's a big deal <laughs> for us, uh, because they have to bring everything up, you know. And people travel uh, extensively. That's the only way they can... Uh, they do have airports in some of the small cities, but you can't afford it. You know, only the politicians can afford it. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't think that changes anywhere in the world. <laughs> uh, but uh, so, you know, things have gotten rough. Uh, we, we've, we've lost four of our pastor's wives uh, to, to, to COVID and one of our pastors. In fact, in the slides I showed tonight, one of the ladies in, in, in the picture and one of the, the men uh, are, are not with us anymore. Uh, they've been, they've graduated to heaven and they're in the presence of the Lord. Uh, also, yesterday, I, I was at a funeral in Stark, Florida, of a good friend, uh, Brother John Strickland. Uh, he pastored Pine Level Baptist Church for a while. That's where my wife is from. He was very instrumental in winning my wife to the Lord, uh, and so and her and her brother. And uh, so it was, uh, it was a, you know, just a, a time to reflect and think. And uh, he, um, but uh, you know, he's uh, he's in heaven now. Uh, he lost an arm to a to a skiing accident. 30, 35 years ago, uh, and um, uh, but he's got his arm back now. <laughs> you know, uh, great man of God, and, and uh, pastored several churches in the area. Worked for Florida State Corrections, also as a counselor, uh, substance abuse, and other things also. Uh, but it's just uh, I'm good to see the family there and rejoicing because uh, he doesn't have to suffer anymore. He had Alzheimer's for the last six years, and that's hard on everybody. <laughs> Maybe some of you have dealed with that. I never have, have dealed with it, but from what I've seen, uh, it's not uh, uh, an easy thing. So, uh, yeah, but, so we're, we're just happy to, to, to be able to, to share in some of these things and be able to stand on the promises because God has given us many, many promises uh, in the Bible uh, about many, many different things. Uh, and so we don't have to... Uh, worry ourselves to death uh, thinking that things are not going to work out because you know God is in control Amen. even though we might not be able to see it exactly yeah. and you know with this election and uh, a new uh, uh, 
party taken over. Uh, a lot of things are happening that we don't like as Christians because it's against God's Word, and unfortunately, God's going to have to judge us for it, even if we're not, you know, a part of it as such. But uh, living in this country, uh, there are consequences. The wages of sin is death. Uh, and the soul that sh sinneth, it shall die. Uh, so there are consequences. But we need to remember, you know, that, that Trump wasn't going to be able to fix everything anyway. Right. And, you know, another good thing is Biden's not going to be able to mess it all up either. <laughs> because God's still in control. Right. Now, like I say there's things we don't like and, and, and like that, but we need to pray for our country. We need to pray for our president. You know, if he could get saved, wouldn't that change a few things? <laughs> that changed a whole... I mean, it'd be like night and day. And it's not impossible. It's not impossible. Nothing's impossible with God. We don't know if it's in His will, but the Bible says pray for those that are over you, for, your, for, for, for the people that, that are in charge. Uh, and not just Him, but, you know, the whole Congress and the Senate and all our state... Uh, legislatures and governors and everybody involved because, uh, you know, uh, the Bible says so that we can continue to preach the gospel so that they won't, uh, you know, cut us off and, and uh, start persecuting the church and, and whatnot. Though sometimes, you know, they say uh, that the, when the church is under persecution, it actually grows more because it costs something to be a Christian. It doesn't cost you anything nowadays. Uh, in some circles, it's quite popular at least to go to church and, you know, say, well, I'm this or I'm that. And to be religious, it's, it's kind of quite popular. But when, you know, when, when it isn't, then you find out who really uh, is a child of God and who isn't. Uh, open your Bibles, if you would, this evening to the book of Luke, chapter 5. And just for a few minutes uh, here, uh, I want to talk a little bit on this, uh, this, this happening here in Luke, chapter 5, uh, with Jesus and his disciples. I want to read the first ten verses to kind of give us a background of what's going on uh, in this particular uh, situation here and try, try to draw some, uh, some things uh, for us today, some things that I believe we can probably put into practice and remember uh, so that we can continue to do that which God has called us to do. Luke chapter 5, verses 1 through 10. And it came to pass that as the people pressed upon him to hear the word of God, he stood by the lake of Gennesaret and saw two ships standing by the lake. But the fishermen were gone out of them and were washing their nets. And he entered into one of the ships, which was Simon's, and prayed him that he would thrust out a little from the land. And he sat down and taught the people out of the ship. Now when he had left speaking, he said unto Simon, Launch out into the deep and let down your nets for a draught. And Simon answering said unto him, Master, we have toiled all the night, and have taken nothing. Nevertheless, at thy word, I will let down the net. And when they had thus done, they enclosed a great multitude of fishes, and their net brake. And they beckoned unto their partners, which were in the other ship, and they, that they should come, and help them. And they came and filled both the ships so that they began to sink. When Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees, saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. For he was astonished, and all that were with him, at the draught of the fishes which they had taken. And so also was James and John, the sons of Zebedee, which were partners with Simon. And Jesus said unto Simon, Fear not, from henceforth thou shalt catch men. A parallel verse also with this is Matthew chapter 4 and verse 19, uh, which I believe is when Jesus was calling, his, starting to call his disciples, and where he said, uh, And he saith unto them, Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Let's pray. Dear Father in heaven, Thank you for this opportunity, Lord, for us to come together, even amongst all the, the things that are going on around us, and uh, a lot of fear and uncertainty and uh, uh, desperation maybe even, and uh, depression and uh, that the world, Lord, uh, feels and experiences because they don't know you, and they don't know that you are in control, and that this is not an accident, 
it all is going to work out for the best. Uh, and, and remembering, Lord, that we live in a world of disease and death. And that we need to be prepared for what will come tomorrow. And Lord, especially as your church, uh, we are faced with many uh, difficulties, uh, many choices. Uh, ministry as we know it has, has totally <laughs> been changed. You know, we can't go out as we used to. Uh, people won't come like they used to uh, because they're afraid. But Lord, help us through your Holy Spirit to be able to know what you would have us to do and how we can continue to preach the gospel. We're still here. You haven't come back and gotten us yet. So according to your word, we need to occupy till you come. And Lord, help us to have the courage and the knowledge through your Holy Spirit to do what you have called us to do. Thank you, Lord, for Central Baptist Church and for their testimony, for their ministry here in Orange Park, Florida, and also through their missions around the world. Uh, may you continue to bless, and may they continue until Jesus comes. Bless your word to our hearts and to our minds. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Uh, as we see here in, in this happening, uh, in chapter 5 of Luke, uh, we see that Jesus... Uh, <clears throat> Uh, was starting his ministry. Uh, he was teaching. And uh, he here uh, involves uh, Peter, James, and John. And uh, uh, also, and he uses some things here that I believe we can use uh, even in our day to day. Uh, we notice that when Jesus called his disciples, he said that he would make them fishers of men. And these were fishermen. And here in Florida, there's a lot of fishermen. Uh, a lot of people like to fish, and uh, either if it's in the rivers or the lakes or the ocean or in the intercoastal waterways. Uh, so a lot of people are familiar with fishing. And you know, when you look at this thing, you know, when he said, uh, there in the, he says, uh, let your nets down for a drop. That means, that doesn't mean they just threw the net in the water. You're not going to catch much if you do that. If y'all have fished, especially uh, with the long nets in, in Brazil on the Amazon, they fish with nets that are three and four and five hundred foot long. And so you have to cast that net, and you don't just throw it in the water. A couple guys in a canoe will grab one end of it, and then the other couple guys in the, in the main, in the bigger canoe, they'll start feeding it, and they'll paddle like crazy. You know, pal, now, now they're using the little stationary engines with a big shaft out the back, you know. But they'd have to paddle, paddle, and I'm, I'm sure that's what they did back then too. Paddle, paddle like crazy, and, and then you spread it out, and then you have to close it. Then you have to draw it from underneath. It's a lot of work, folks. I mean, those fishermen, it's, thankfully, it's not all day long. Otherwise, they'd pass out from fatigue. <laughs> Because it is a lot of work. And you know, the net is weighted. It's got uh, lead on it. <laughs> it has to sink. And so that the fish will swim. And then they'll enclose them and bring them up. So it's a lot of work. And you know, being a Christian and working for the Lord sometimes is a lot of work. It's not just sitting in a boat someplace. We have to go out there. We have to catch the fish. We have to go where they are. It costs money. It costs time. It needs training. And as we look at this passage of Scripture here, uh, we, we see uh, that they were catching fish. And I don't know what kind of fish are in the Sea of, of Gennesaret or the Sea of Galilee. Uh, but uh, that's how they made their living. They had a little business going here. You know, Peter, uh, or, you know, Peter James, John, their dad. Uh, and then they had some hired help, too. Uh, if you'll, I think in the book of Matthew or Mark talks about the hired help also. And so uh, that, that's what they were doing for a living. Now, as we look here, we see uh, what kind of fish are we supposed to catch? Verses 31 and 32 of, of Luke chapter 5 says, And Jesus answering said unto them, They that are whole need not a physician, but they that are sick. I came not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. And notice there, he's calling people to repentance. What is repentance? Basically, it's, it's a change of mind. Uh, it's a change of direction also. And w what is this change of mind or change of direction? We have to preach the gospel. What is the gospel? The death, burial, 
and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And it's a calling uh, for men and women, boys and girls, to change their minds about themselves and about sin. Because if you ask a person, are you a sinner? I don't know, you might even get slapped. <laughs> Nowadays, I don't know. Uh, because most people don't consider themselves a sinner. Unless you're uh, in, in Rayford, Florida. Uh, <laughs> my brother-in-law worked there for a while. My father-in-law worked there for a while. Uh, or the other Lottie Correctional Facilities and things like that. Uh, they don't, you know, now, those guys, those are sinners. Especially Rayford. That's where they keep all the, you know, the, the maximum security prisoners. Uh, Lottie's not quite as bad. It's still bad, but it's not quite. And now, you, the people would say, no, they're sinners. Because they, they killed somebody, or, or they, they stole, or, or they uh, kidnapped someone, or, or things like that. But the Bible says, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. So we have a big field. Right now, you know, I know some people are saved, but there are 7,800,000,000 people in this earth, on this earth. I don't even know how many that is. I don't, know, I, I don't think I can, I can count that high. And it's growing. We have about 120 people that die every minute and about 240 that are born every minute. That's what the statistics are for, I think, 2018 or something. But so there's, you know, as we see, that, that's what, what's going on in our world. Uh, we're looking for sick people, sin-sick people. As one of our songs says, sin-sick souls. That's what our job is. We have to try to catch him. Now, as we look at this passage of Scripture, I find it, found it interesting that from this narrative, we see here that God uses human methods or human agency. We see that the drought of fishes was miraculous. No doubt about it. But we see that neither the fisherman, nor his boat, nor his fishing tackle were ignored. All of it was used to take this miraculous draught of fishes. And so it is in the saving of souls. God works by means. And while we are in the church age, we, we know that God is pleased by the foolishness of preaching to save those who believe. Amen. That's how folks get saved, people. Uh, yeah, that's how people get saved, isn't it? Amen. It's by the foolishness of preaching. It's not by the music. It's not by theater. It's not by choreography. Right. It's not uh, all the other things that some churches do. And some of those things are okay. Others I'm not so sure about. <laughs> but, you know, we have to we use human means. Man. God uses people. Uh, Paul in Romans chapter 10, verses 14 through 17, uh, he asked four or five questions there. And those questions are, you know, how are they going to preach if they're not sent? Who's going to send them? Uh, how shall they believe if they don't hear? And that all takes people. Here in Orange Park and anywhere else in the world. Uh, you know, the internet is good and we can preach the gospel. We can use radio. We can use television if you can afford it. <laughs> the internet's a lot cheaper. Uh, uh, but the thing is, is, you know, somebody has to be on the ground. Because once those people accept Christ, they need a church to go to. Yeah. Right. They need Amen. fellowship. You know? I don't like it when I, when I can't go to church. No. <laughs> you know? it, it just it doesn't feel right. I get nervous and I pace up and down. And you know, I can't sit down. I can't hardly stand up. Because I'm supposed to be in church. Yeah. I mean, I've been going since I was born probably. Maybe, I don't know, mom probably only spent back in those days, you know, maybe just a day or so in the hospital. Uh, and... Um, you know, then they came home, and I'm sure the next Sunday I was in church. So that's been almost 65 years. So, you know, it, it's, it's just a, it's something that we do. And especially after I accepted the Lord my Savior, then, then it got interesting. <laughs> Before I went, because Mom and Dad said, you have to go. <laughs> but as we see here, God uses means. You know, God works without instruments sometimes, and without means, and He is glorified. But God Himself has selected this way to reach people for Christ. He told the church, Go ye. Go ye. And I'm a ye. 
into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. And then in Acts he says, and ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and in Judea and in Samaria and all the way to the Amazon River. And folks, you know, y'all have a witness there. You have a witness there because you have prayed for us and you have financially helped us for many years now. And so, you know, y'all are there. Maybe not in person. But one of these days when we get to heaven, you'll be able to meet those people personally Amen. who were saved because somebody sent a missionary. Amen. Brother John Strickland was very instrumental in, in, uh, in my wife's salvation. My, uh, my brother-in-law, he's old, five years older than Betty, he was hitchhiking and a preacher picked him up. This was back uh, right after the Vietnam War. He had served and he had come back and he was looking for his family. Uh, not a real good family situation. And uh, he was looking for his family and, and uh, Brother, Pastor John Strickland picked him up, witnessed to him, uh, and uh, gave him a Bible. Uh, and so he started reading a little bit of it and got interested in it. Uh, and then uh, he told Betty about it. Uh, and during that time, too, was a very tense situation. Uh, their oldest brother had been put in a mental institution. Uh, he just, he'd lost hope completely. He's completely lost hope in life and everything else. And he had gotten out of the mental institution and bought a weapon, and he bought a thousand rounds of ammunition. And he went out in the woods. You know, you have a few here in, Texas, here in Florida. Went out in the woods, and he shot 999 rounds. And the 1,000th round was for him. And he committed suicide. And through that, uh, Brother John Strickland did the funeral. <laughs> because Roger had met him, and he'd given him his card, too. So he, 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 didn't, he didn't know any preachers except Brother John Strickland. He was pastor in Pine Level Baptist Church in Stark, Florida. Just down the road a little ways. And through that, it got Betty in church. Uh, got, got the whole family in church. Uh, about a month later, a missionary named Leon Thomas, who was a missionary to Peru at the time, came and he was at a mission conference there. And he preached about missions, and Betty surrendered her life to missions. And then God had to send her all the way to Maslin, Ohio, to meet me. <laughs> and we've been preaching the gospel uh, as a couple for 44 years. Uh, it's marvelous how God's work. He uses means, folks. He uses people. We just have to be willing to say, Lord, what do you want me to do? And so it's interesting here that God uses people. Now, it's interesting also that, uh, you know, uh, methods or, or means by themselves are not sufficient. They're not sufficient. Uh, what did Peter say? And I can see Peter. You, you, know, you all know Peter. He was quite a character. And he can say, Lord... <laughs> Oh, man, we fished all night long. I'm tired. Or as we'd say in Texas, tired. <laughs> I'm tired, Lord. Oh, he was a fisherman. His, his grammar probably wasn't that good, except he was probably speaking Hebrew. <laughs> but but as, as we see here, uh, you know, he told all night uh, that was the best time to fish. They were professional fishermen. That's what they did for a living. Uh, and, uh, and they didn't catch anything. And what was the reason for that they didn't catch anything? Now, as we apply this, uh, we can see here, uh, were they not fishermen, you know, doing what they knew how to do best? They weren't raw hands. They understood their work. <laughs> and, uh, you know, uh, they, they were, they were, un were they unskillful? No. Did they lack perseverance? <laughs> no, they, uh, they, they, they worked at it. Uh, they had toiled all night. Was there a deficiency of fish in the sea? No. no. Because when Jesus, when the Master came, they swam into the net in shoals. And the other account of it, I think, says they caught 154 big ones. Now, you know how fishermen are. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, they'll catch one this size, and by the time they tell the story about ten times, it's a whale. <laughs> you know, it's a whale. Uh, and, and so, we see that means by themselves are unavailing. Uh, and what is the reason that means are unavailing? 
It's because there is no power in the means by themselves apart from the presence of Jesus. Amen. We have to exercise our faith in Him. What did Jesus say in John 15, 5? Without me, you can do what? Nothing. nothing. And nothing is nothing, isn't it? <laughs> so we need to depend on Jesus Christ. Uh, uh, you know, and the Bible says with Christ we can do all things. I can do all things through Christ who strengtheneth me. Uh, according to the fishermen, the best time to fish was past. No doubt about it. Uh, and as we look at our situation today, we might think because of this, of this pandemic that maybe the best time to fish for men <clears throat> is past. Looking at it from a human standpoint, <clears throat> we, we might be able to think that. It's become difficult. <laughs> it was already difficult before the pandemic to get people to come. But what about now? Yeah, some countries you can't even have services, period. Uh, you know, uh, people are afraid. Uh, we live in a generation that uh, the, the, the cell phone has taken over. And it's disturbing how much time people spend on the Internet and on their cell phones. Uh, I read one place and they said seven hours. I read another place, they said 11 hours. And today coming up here on the radio, I heard it was 13 and a half hours per day. I wish I could get rid of the dumb thing. <laughs> I liked it when we had stationary phones. You know. Because uh, then if you weren't home, you didn't have to answer it. <laughs> you know. But <clears throat> it's taken over people's lives. And it's not just here, folks. <clears throat> it's everywhere in the world. You know the Indians in Brazil that live on the reservation? There is no internet on the reservation. They live sometimes 100, 200 miles from the nearest city. They all have cell phones. They can play games on them. And when they go into town, then they can get a signal, and then they can use them. And they know how to use it better than I do. <laughs> I'm not real smart. Uh, I, whenever I need to do something, I give it to my seven-year-old granddaughter. And she can do stuff I never dreamed of doing. <laughs> but you see, uh, you, uh, you know, it's, uh, it seems like, you know, wh what's the church going to do? How are we going to reach people? You know, it's hard to go out on visitation. Most people, you know, they don't want, they don't want to see you. They're scared to death that you might give them something. <laughs> But when Jesus gave the Great Commission, did He put any stipulations on that commandment? Did Jesus not know that in 2020 we were going to have a COVID pandemic and that everybody's going to be shut up in their houses? I think He knew. Right. Of course He did. He's God. <laughs> but He still gave the Great Commission. And He didn't put any stipulations on it. He said, Occupy till I come. Has He come yet? Well, I hope not, because I'm still here, and I want to go, <laughs> you know. Uh, and so, so we see uh, that uh, we might think that the best time is past, but maybe it isn't. Maybe God is going to use this in a different way, something that He will, uh, will show us exactly, and we might even reach more people. And we as Christians, I believe, need to take advantage of this time because we, we probably have a little bit more time on our hands. We can't go shopping as much as we used to. <laughs> you know, you can't, you can't take uh, uh, cruises anymore. Um, uh, you know, there's a lot of things that, that have been restricted. Are you reading your Bible more? And something that we can all do at all times in any kind of situation, and that is pray. We can still pray. Pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest, that he will send forth laborers into his harvest. Why aren't we seeing more missionaries? It might be because we're not praying that way. It might be. When I went to Brazil in, uh, in uh, 19, 1980, we had 20, 26 missionary families in Brazil with the World Baptist Fellowship. You know how many we have today? Remember, the population in 1980 
well, of Brazil was about 150 million. Now we have, no, I'm sorry, 130 million. Now we have 212 million people. We have four missionary families with World Baptist Fellowship. What happened? Well, the ones that went got old, like me. <laughs> you know. Uh, and some of them got sick. Some of them are in heaven, like Dad. <laughs> uh, and, and, and many of the others. Uh, we just lost one of our ex-missionaries to Brazil last week, uh, Jay Conway. Uh, he passed away in Mineral Wells, Texas. Uh, in fact, the funeral is tomorrow. My daughter's going to going to go and extend our condolences to the family. I knew Jay very well. I was on furlough with him a few times. Uh, worked in southern Brazil. I didn't see him too much in Brazil. Only when we came home on furlough. <laughs> uh, that's, but, you know, I just did, did a good job while he was there for, for many years. But, but you know, we, we can still pray. And we have maybe a little bit more time. Luke 11, 9 through 10 says, And I say unto you, Ask, and it shall be given you. Seek, and ye shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. For everyone that asketh, receiveth. And he that seeketh, findeth. And to him that knocketh, it shall be opened. That's a promise. It's a promise. Actually, there's more than one in there. There's a whole bunch of promises in that verse. But we can still pray. Now, and now as we look at this, we see uh, that there's one thing uh, that, uh, that that is necessary also, and that is obedience. What if Peter had not obeyed the Lord? They would have caught nothing. <laughs> they would have caught nothing. You know, Christ's presence gives us success. His presence in our lives. His presence in everything that we do. Uh, as we live our lives and as we meditate on God's Word, as we pray, as we put Christ in first, in first place, we need to focus on that. The Bible says that we are vessels. And the Bible talks about vessels to honor and vessels to dishonor. They're all necessary. Except in the Christian walk, it's not good to be a vessel of dishonor. And, you know, God has, has purified those vessels through the blood of Jesus Christ. He has cleansed us from all sin. But, as we walk in the world in our daily walk, we hear things, we see things, maybe we touch things or even taste things that get us a little dirty. Because the world is not a friendly place for the gospel of Jesus Christ. In fact, it's against us. And so, what do we need to do? We need to take a spiritual shower. How is, how is the, the Christian cleansed? By the washing of the Word, the Bible says. God's Word. That's why we need to read our Bibles every day. Don't you take a bath every day? If not, your wife's going to get after you. <laughs> or, you know, I don't know if husbands probably wouldn't. You know, that, that's not that important. <laughs> but I know the wives would, you know. Uh, it, it, it's just, you know, it, it, it's, it's just good hygiene. It keeps you from getting a lot of diseases. And, it, it, you know, uh, if you want to have a few friends, you might want to take a shower <laughs> now and then, <laughs> you know. I, but we have to clean ourselves spiritually also because things stick to us. I mean, you don't even have to go looking for dirt, do you? It just grabs you anyway. Even when you're out there, uh, and uh, Betty sometimes says, where did all that dust come? I just dusted two days ago. And the house, the doors are closed, the windows are locked, it has central air, it has a filter. Where did all that dust come from? I don't know how it gets in the house. Any of you all have a little bit of dust in your house? <laughs> uh, if you're really going to keep it spotless, I think you probably have to dust every day. And we have to dust ourselves spiritually. And the only way we can do that is through God's Word. That's the only thing that will keep us pure and keep us vessels unto honor. Vessels that God can use to preach the Gospel. Because, you see, God has no witnesses but us. We're it, folks. That's how God is said by the foolishness of preaching and by our testimony. That's how people are drawn to the Gospel. But if we don't have a testimony... If we're just as dirty as everybody else out there, there's no difference. 
And I don't mean you have to walk around with your collar up to your neck and your dress dragging on the floor. It's too expensive, you know, to wash all the time. And, uh, I, and you know, sleeves down halfway to your hands. And, uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm not talking about those things, but I'm talking about your testimony for Jesus Christ. I believe that people should look at you and start to think, there's something different. There's, I, I can't put my finger on it, <laughs> but there's something different about that person. And then they begin to ask questions. And then you can pre present the gospel of Jesus Christ to them. That's what it's all about. That's why we're still here. Because God has something for us to do. Otherwise, He'd just take us on to heaven. At least we wouldn't be a bad testimony, if nothing else, because of that. You know, we wouldn't, uh, we wouldn't continue to sin. We wouldn't uh, forget to do what God wants us to do. We need to obey God. And we can only do that through the strength that is in the Scriptures and naturally, uh, us, our prayer, prayers. Because the Bible is God communicating to us. And prayer is us communicating to God. And finding out exactly what His will. How did I know that I was supposed to go to Brazil? How did Pastor know that he was supposed to be a preacher? How did he know? I believe because of prayer. And of reading God's Word. You know, God talked to him, and he talked to God. And they figured it out, you know, they hashed it out. And, 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 you know, uh, God already, of course, God already knows, but still, you know, He, he, he tells us, too. And I, I haven't found a scripture that says, Tim Hawkins, you're going to Brazil as a missionary. I haven't found that yet. Uh, and I don't know if preachers found one. Uh, pastor Thoreau, you're going to pastor the Central Baptist Church in Orange Park, Florida, for so many years. I, I don't think there's a, there's a Bible verse. But God led him here. How? Bible reading and prayer. And God will lead you. And I think that's one of the biggest problems. We're spending too much time on the Internet. We used to say you're spending too much time watching television. <laughs> but now it's the Internet. The cell phones. And it has completely robbed us of our youth. Completely robbed us of our youth. It's become a God. Where they, do, they don't want to do anything else. Where they can't, they can't live without it. I was reading a few months back about a, a young lady... Uh, and they, they uh, put her into rehab because uh, she had an addiction to her cell phone. I mean, this girl was addicted. Every night before she went to bed, she would tape it to her hand so that if she woke up in the middle of the night or somebody sent her a message or something, she could look at it. Because if she laid it on the table and couldn't find it, she'd have a panic attack. It's just as addictive as alcohol or cigarettes or drugs or anything else. It just dominated her life. And we see that. You know, you see these, these stars on, uh, some of them from Hollywood and some otherwise, where, you know, they, they have so many million followers. You know, where they're always looking at their screen to see what their, what, what their blogger or whatever, you know, whoever the, the person is, uh, to see what they're doing and the latest fashion and what they're suggesting and all kinds of stuff like that. And that's all they do. It's become their God. And there's a lot of Christians involved in that too. A lot of Christians involved in that. I know a few. I know a few. But we see it depends upon obedience. Christ's presence is what gives us success, but we have to obey Him. When Jesus is lifted up in the church, His presence is the church's power. The shout of a king is in the midst of her. And Jesus himself said, I, if I am lifted up, will draw all men to me. And that's what it's all about. That's what the church's uh, uh, job is, I guess you could say. That's what we're here for, is to draw men to Jesus Christ. To be a witness. And I, like I say, I don't have all the answers. I don't know exactly how we're going to do that with the situation we're in right now. But, I, th I think we might have to go back to our families and try to get our families. If we have unsaved loved ones, start praying for them. And I mean praying for them, not just saying, Lord bless so-and-so. But if they're not saved, start praying specifically for their salvation. And then maybe you've got you, uh, so, so, you know, your immediate family, but then you've got your, your in-laws and maybe a few outlaws too. <laughs> you know? and, and, and then you have your co-workers, if you work. Uh, or, you know, if you're retired, uh, you might uh, have 
belong to a club or something, or you might meet some people here or there for this or that and whatnot. Uh, if you, if you, you know, maybe teach in a school, or, uh, there, there's all. I, I think we need to focus on on those people. You know, if each one of us Christians, if we could win one person per year and disciple that person, so that that person would also win another person in one year, we could win seven billion eight hundred million people in thirty two years. It's not impossible. Even with COVID. <laughs> it's not impossible. We just don't have enough faith, I'm afraid. And we're not really serious about it many times. Not all the time. Sometimes we get serious about it, I understand. But we need to focus, folks. Because that's the reason we're here. I don't know how much time we have. I think that this is one of the first things. I think this is kind of like a trial run uh, for the Antichrist to see how much people will accept his control. And that's what it's all about. It's really not about COVID. I mean, a virus that has a 99.8% survival rate. Folks, in 2018, 200,000 people died of the flu in the USA. In 2018. It's not, it's not like the bubonic plague. It's not even close to the Spanish flu of 1910, where I think uh, 3 million Americans died. And there were a lot less Americans in 1910. Uh, what, 200 and something million? If it was today, it, it would be like 8 million people. If you, if you did the, you know, uh, did the math and everything, found out the correlation, uh, it would be like 8 million people dying today if we had another Spanish flu epidemic. And what? What do we have? 300? Or is it up to 300,000? It's approaching 500. Okay, it's so pro uh, okay. 475. 475. And that's 475,000 too many. I agree. I agree with that. But it's not, you know, something that, that is, but, but it's about control. And one of the things that the Bible talks about, uh, the Antichrist, he's going to control the finances of the world. And folks, a lot of people are having trouble with their finances. Governments. You know, our government's just printing money. It's $1.9 trillion for this package. There's so much pork on there, if it fell on us, it'd kill us. You all know what pork is, don't you? You know, it's all the pet projects that these senators and, and everything everybody has. Uh, really, they only need about $300 billion. That's still too much money. <laughs> but they're just printing the money. And our kids and grandkids are going to pay for it later on. And if, if they keep on doing it, the country's going to go belly up. You can only bluff so long. And if you look at that, you get discouraged. You might even go into depression <laughs> if you think about our world and, and uh, we're just, you know, we're one step away from mass chaos. Texas proved that this week. You know, we get five days of, of ice and it shut the whole state down. Couldn't move. Betty hadn't been out of the house for a week and a half, two weeks. You, you know, just a little winter storm. And God can do a lot, whole lot more than that if you really wanted to. But I think it's setting the stage for, 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 the, for the world control that, that will be necessary so that the Antichrist can take over. But folks, we need to go fishing. There's still time. There's still time to fish. And I don't know how many we're going to catch. But remember, the orders come from God Himself and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And if he told us to fish, we need to fish. That means there's some out there. We might not catch hundreds of thousands, but we can catch some. And so we, we, we just need to, to, to fish until Christ comes back. That's what he said, occupy till I come. And uh, I know there's a few unsaved people in Orange Park. Now, we have a lot of them in Manaus still. 30, we have more than 80 suburbs in Manaus. We only have 35 churches. That means there's, we need to plant 55 more churches, at least. And some of those suburbs have 40,000 people in them. You know, it's hard for one church to reach 40,000 people. 
They say that the average amount of people that one church can reach is 5,000 people. So do the math. How many churches do we need in Manaus? 2.1 million divided by 5,000. And that will give you how many churches. And then you have all the interior. And then you have the rest of Brazil. And then you have the rest of the world. <laughs> we need to do a lot of fishing. And we need to obey Christ's command. Keep ourselves clean so that He can use us. And trust Him that He has called us to this great job. The most important thing in all the world. As Jesus Himself said on the Sermon on the Mount. What shall it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? And what will a man give in exchange for his soul? It's a very good question. And it's a question that many people don't want to answer because they can't answer it. Because they are trading their souls for the here and now, for things of this world. And when they leave, you're not going to take anything with you. Nothing. Not one penny. <laughs> not, not, not one, uh, uh, not one knick-knack. Not one thing that you own. Not your glasses even. <laughs> you know. Nothing. And not even your cell phone. <laughs> you know. It's all going to be left behind. That's why Jesus said that we should work for those things that are non-perishable. And that's the spiritual things. And that is working for Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Dear Father in heaven.